Welcome to Define, the podcast making the most important projects in DeFi easy to understand and accessible to all. Every episode, we sit down with a team who are building to solve important issues of our modern societies. This week, we speak to Sam Kazemian, the founder of decentralized stablecoin protocol Frax Finance, covering his journey into crypto, the future of stablecoins, stablecoin regulation, inflation, and much more. To kick things off, it would be great to get to know who you are and what led you to discovering crypto even before you you, you got into, into Frax. Yeah, of course. It's actually been so long because now when I think back on it, I originally got into crypto back around 2013 when I was a student wow. at UCLA and I was studying neuroscience and philosophy. I was a double major. It had nothing to do with, you know, coding or, or crypto or anything like that. Uh, what happened was I had a friend just like briefly talk about Bitcoin, just like he wasn't even sure what it was. And that's the first time that I had heard about it. And then I I went online to like research it or figure out what it was. And it turns out in my group of friends, I was the guy that ended up going down the rabbit hole like really, really hard. And I started mining a Bitcoin and, and Dogecoin was actually one of the first cryptocurrencies I started mining. Back then, it was getting to be really infeasible to, to mine SHA-256. It was actually kind of like the tail end of like the GPU mining era of, of uh, SHA-256. And it was more the script coins and the first altcoin boom that, that was really taking off. Um, it was like around the time, right before and right after the first time there was a huge Bitcoin run up, the first 1300, you know, Bitcoin. Wow. Run yeah. And that seems like so long ago now, right? What was interesting was like I built out these mining rigs, these GPU mining rigs as like a, a student. I was like super broke. So the what I did was I worked in um, a neurophysics lab and some other places at, in campus. And when they had these computers that they would throw away because they bought new ones and, and stuff for, for data modeling and, and all these things, what I did is I harvested the power supplies and the motherboards because the motherboards <laughs> had PCIe slots for GPUs. And if you shorted them in a uh, in like a proper sequence, you could connect a GPU to all of them, assuming that they had enough power from external power supplies. And so like I, I built this kind of, crazy contraption of like a bunch of motherboards and and gpus that i sourced and some bought and stuff um it was fun it was a fun two two-ish years i mined a lot of dogecoin back then so that was cool i never thought that it would be used as the future currency of mars according to elon <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was uh it, it was pretty cool and, and glad I got into it when I did. Yeah, that, that's that's super cool. So you you had your whole kind of mining rig set up while you were working. Yeah, while I was like basically in the UCLA dorms. And what's interesting is, you know, in college here, we like pay tuition like per quarter or semester or something. And it's like flat rate because it covers room and board and, and tuition and stuff. So as long as I didn't blow the fuse on the like entire unit, Essentially, right. like there was no electrical cost; it was all prepaid. So I was actually like, "This is great, right? This is uh, this is awesome." That's that's super super cool. You know, what was like the the journey or trajectory from there that led you to to what you're doing at Frax now? Yeah, so I actually started kind of teaching myself coding and and things like that around the same time. Me and my friends built the first company that we started called Everpedia, which is. Mm -hmm kind of like the crypto encyclopedia on the blockchain and there's like incentivized with the token. Back then when we first originally started it, it was in like 2015. So there was no crypto component because like Ethereum had just like been announced. There's no conception of, oh, like build decentralized version of like Facebook or Wikipedia or any right. of this stuff. So it was just actually a, a content website. Everpedia was kind of like a different version of Wikipedia. And we released a token in, in 2018. It's gone really well. Everpedia is actually super profitable. They're building on Ethereum. We, we started on as EOS and then moved a lot of our stack over when a lot of Ethereum tooling and, and optimization made it possible to like edit stuff and all the DeFi stuff really got going. 
And that's when I kind of came to realize, in my opinion, the, the smart contract stuff is all on Ethereum, right? There's no really no distraction of all of these other chains there. They're all fine, but there's just not as much economic activity. Yeah. And so we started Everpedia and, and it went really well, we raised over 30 million from Galaxy Digital, which is Mike Novogratz's firm. Yeah. And that's uh, gone super well. My, my colleague and, and friend Teddy is the CEO there. But the, the same time around is, is when I started really thinking about stable coins and DeFi, even though back then in 2019, like, no one was saying the word DeFi, you know, if, if, yeah, like no one was saying decentralized finance and, and stuff. It was just kind of maker was growing. The DAI supply was growing. There was like nascent like lending stuff. And I was always interested in stable coins because I, I have this view that's actually a little bit anti both BTC maximalist and, and anti ETH maximalists when my view is personally actually that none of these assets are good currencies. Uh, this is just kind of my, my kind of ideology, you know, and I always thought that their stable coins were going to be the currency. They're basically also a trillion dollar uh, narrative, but Bitcoin and Ethereum are also trillion dollar narratives for sure. And they're really good, you know, investments and, you know, stuff I, I was interested in for years, but they're not currency. Things won't be denominated in them everywhere, you know, like the maxis of both camps, like kind of <laughs> you know, believe just because it seems really obvious that a good currency has to at least try or be somewhat good at keeping your standard of living the same, right? Which is the, mm -hmm. the basket of goods of, of consumer items or, or like energy and, and things like that. And the currency should relatively track those things, you know, like, like rent, food, you know, water, like uh, electrical costs and cars and transportation right. and things like that, right? Things that humans care about in, in the real world. So I started forming those beliefs in like 2018, 2019, and I thought of, well, it's not that interesting to basically be like stable coins are the future. Let's build like Tether or something or like uh, another fiat coin and stuff. Essentially, I didn't think it would have been interesting to build USDC or try to compete with anything there. I actually thought that the end game of all of this stuff was probably some kind of decentralized algorithmic stablecoin. And so like, if you guys probably remember back then, it was like Basis was raising money and, you know, they they were saying they're going to launch this fully decentralized uh, algorithmic stablecoin. And the, the thing that really captured everyone's attention was like, this should have been kind of the holy grail, right? Assuming it works and stuff, which we now know in retrospect, not only does it not work, it works really, really poorly. But if you have a fully decentralized protocol that can track some kind of monetary policy, obviously everyone uses the dollar because the dollar is kind of the standard unit. But the idea would be that you have this protocol and that it would track some price target per coin, right? Per stable coin. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of when I went down the rabbit hole and kind of that's the first inkling of Frax, just as kind of an idea around early 2019. That's super interesting. And did you have like an ideological reason for creating something that was not 100% fiat backed? Or I mean, like, what was your view of the competition of Tether and some of the other stable coins you mentioned on, on the landscape? And what led you to designing Frax the way that you did? Yeah, I mean, the, the main thing was that, first of all, I was just intellectually curious that there was just these two uh, large camps in terms of decentralized stablecoin design, right? There was mm -hmm. the over collateralized model, right, which was 150% or whatever collateralized with, with MakerDAO, which is essentially, you know, selling leverage, right? And the 0% collateralized model, right, with, with basis and just no no collateral, nothing in the protocol, and you will just change the supply of the stablecoin algorithmically, you know, increase it to bring the price back down to a dollar, lower the supply of the stablecoin to bring the price back up to a dollar if it falls. And I just thought, what's in the middle, right? Like, what's in the middle of this giant spectrum between 0% collateral and like 150%? Like, there must be something that's like, 
fractional or like a fractional algorithmic or hybrid or whatever you want to call it. And so I started thinking like there must be something in the middle here because back then, even though basis and ESP and all those things weren't tried until 2020, I just didn't think they would work. Otherwise, Frax would be a, you know, 0%, you know, <laughs> meme alco coin that would have probably <laughs> lasted about a month or two or something, right? But yeah, I just didn't think they would work. And the idea with Frax is actually super simple, right? It was that let's just build a stable coin that's fractionally collateralized. But instead of creating a system where it's opaque and we just say, oh, well, we don't know what the reserve ratio will be. Let's just do token holder voting because like we have no idea how to design like a fractional like algorithm or something. Uh, let's just meet every day or every week or whatever. I don't know how often it is that the maker you know, committee meets or, or votes or whatever, but let's just meet and decide like a reserve ratio or something. And, and that's, then that's the whole protocol. We thought that that would be weird. And then like that wouldn't really capture a lot of imagination and interest of, of the crypto community. So we, we thought, why don't we actually just use market dynamics and build a protocol that's dynamically changing its collateral ratio based on the price of the stable coin, right? Because the price of the stable coin itself is the market's confidence in the monetary policy of, of the whole protocol, right? I mean, if you have frack stable coins and you, know, you see that it's like 83% backed, and you're like, this looks like a disaster waiting to happen or something, uh, you can just sell it, right? And then if you know you sell it and if it goes down, right, if the price goes to 99 cents, which you have like a one cent band on each side, the protocol increases its collateral ratio, right? It actually use the people's selling of fracks as a indicator, almost like it's almost like people who own fracks get to vote on the actual reserve requirements by voting with their feet, right? By getting rid of the stable coin or holding it or buying it. And so it's, it's actually a pretty elegant model because you have this system where the collateral ratio is whatever will keep the price at the peg. And that's the peg is defined by a 1% band on each side. So 99 cents and then 101 cents. And what's really cool and what we're really proud of is since launch, we've never broken the peg even once. We've never broken the peg where it's gone outside of those bounds and the protocols become, you know, like uncontrollable or erratic and, and stuff. So we're really proud of actually having the only, I think, as far as I'm aware, perfect track record for a algorithmic stable coin of, you know, not the leverage, you know, over collateralized variety because right. there's a lot of those. Big credit to you guys and hope to see that that pick stay here as time goes on. I, I was just kind of thinking in terms of some of the things you mentioned about, you know, the transparency of the way Frax operates and the governance model. Things are kind of, at least right now, they appeal mostly to people kind of in the crypto community or in the DeFi community. You know, curious to know how you would kind of market Frax. If you were to like explain to someone who just had like very superficial understanding of, of crypto and kind of what like the problem is that, that Frax is solving. Some people might not like this because it might invoke some, some regulatory concern, but I usually try to just not worry about that and try to describe things as it is. So one of the ways that I actually like to describe Frax to non-crypto people, either finance people or even just regular, you know, people in, in other fields is Frax is kind of like an automated money market fund. And so uh, if, for people who don't know, money market funds are basically, you know, the, the things you that are supposed to be fairly safe compared to like investment funds or hedge funds. And you put your dollars in and you get very small yield, but that's usually more than the, you know, the federal funds interest rate. And and so what people do is, you know, if you put in like a, a million dollars into a money market fund, the, the money market fund managers will invest it in essentially low, low risk bonds that, you know, give a little bit of yield, but then the you can always pull out a million dollars. Essentially, the fund is cash equivalent. And so you can kind of think about Frax as this transparent, automated money market fund. And the ratio of like, you know, the algorithmic portion of Frax, which is, you know, essentially stabilized by the Frax share token, the FXS token, which is the governance token, and then the collateral portion, which is, 
you know, the, the portion that has liquid crypto, essentially cash equivalents, right? You can kind of think of this as kind of an automated algorithm that people will come to, to get frack stable coins and then they can see, okay, what's the actual assets that this, this protocol, this essentially automated money market fund is holding and has deployed, you know, capital in or like the type of collateral that it holds in and stuff like that. And the cool thing about it is because it's on chain, there's no components that are off chain. There's no company for Frax. There's there's no foundation even. It's just kind of a distributed project that, that we're working on with other people and, and stuff. Everyone can just see exactly the addresses, the labeled public collateral pools, the AMOs, which we, we could probably uh, get into, which is one of my, my favorite things. And you could just make a decision. Oh, I can see what this protocol is doing. I can see what this money market fund that's kind of automated running on chain is composed of. I can see exactly the collateral ratio, like how much assets it has on its balance sheet, how much of it has to kind of be compensated by the FRAC share token, right? The, the governance and signage token. And I can make a decision, right? I can make an informed market decision. Do I want to use this stable coin or do I want to stay away from it? Right. And one of the things is like, you know, you hear all of these criticisms about Tether or like USDC saying like, well, who's going to audit Tether or like Tether released an audit, but it's like sketchy or like, you know, who is this audit firm or like they didn't say the composition of what their bonds are. And then, mm-hmm. you know, maybe now they did, but then they didn't actually say the, you know, the, the grading of them or, or things like that. And what's interesting is like, that's because they have to operate in the fiat world, right? Where everything is opaque and you have to figure out convoluted ways to, you know, trustlessly or, or like, you know, in a, in a, you know, manner where people don't have to trust the organization, release the info, but on chain, no one has to trust you. It's right there. They can actually just look in real time and be like, this is the entire assets of, of this protocol in real time. This is what it's doing. It's essentially an audit every single 15 seconds, right? When, when the blocks change. You mentioned Tether and USDC, but you're so affected by that, right? Because your your collateral is held in USDC? Yeah. So so one of the most potent and correct things that, that people say about Frax, and so mm-hmm. now that we're talking about the, the good stuff, we should talk about some of the critiques, is that it's like, hey, you guys have built something really cool. This is totally new, novel thing, but a lot of your collateral, almost all of it right now, is USDC. So you're kind of like somewhat wrapped, fractionalized USDC. And while that's actually true right now, so admittedly, the the stats right now is that Frax is 83% back. A substantial portion of that is USDC. We've actually been working pretty hard the past few months to release some, some really cool things about how we're actually going to lower USDC dependence to either near zero or or very close to it. In fact, one of the first things we're going to release soon is what we call the decentralization ratio, which is a different kind of uh, collateral ratio, which has a systematic way of calculating how much of the protocol's collateral is fully decentralized and how much of it is in assets that have custodial risk, right? Like fiat coins or, or like real world assets, like, you know, securities or things like that. And What's really cool about this is I think it's the very first time that, you know, a stable coin, a project is going to issue its own kind of like grading algorithm in, in actually defining its own collateral and releasing how it's calculating its decentralization ratio versus its like, you know, dependence on USDC or other fiat coins. And this algorithm can actually be used in, in other protocols. So actually what we could do is we can measure, for example, MakerDAO's decentralization ratio. We can measure phase decentralization ratio or, or other stable coins. And we're working really hard to essentially lower USDC reliance in the next two to three months down to about close to zero. It's, it's going to be difficult, but I think if we can get it close to low single digits, I think most people will be able to see that if fiat coins, you know, collapse or if there's a big regulatory black swan event where 
you know, they have to be forced to say no decentralized protocol can use them or, or something like that, that will not affect FRAX in terms of the peg at all. And it will basically not have to worry about that. But, you know, we're working on that. And actually, I'll, I'll probably be releasing some public info in the next two weeks. But as of right now, yeah, a lot of our collateral is USDC just so that essentially we can prove the fundamental you know, theory of, of like fractional algorithmic stablecoins sound by not having to worry about the actual collateral itself being extremely volatile against the dollar, which is the, the price peg. So what are some of the assets that you're considering for like diversification for your collateral? Or is that something you can't go into just yet? No, I we're definitely considering collateral that's decentralized. I mean, there's no secret collateral that you know, people have been overlooking. A lot of it is ETH. A lot of it will be collateral of, of things that actually we have tight integrations with in terms of AMOs and, and things like that. And I think that the design is the thing that's really important. It's because you can just have a bunch of ETH and then hope that, you know, ETH doesn't collapse or like, you know, it doesn't go down. And as long as everything's going up, everything's fine, right? But it's when the price against the dollar goes down very quickly that problems start in terms of keeping the peg. So the assets actually aren't super exotic. It's the actual design that I'm, I'm really excited about. It has to do with both our gauges and the way that we actually hedge against volatility, which partially uses really interesting strategies in Uniswap V3 for, for range orders. But we'll, we'll announce some of that stuff in the next few weeks. I think the first thing that we're doing is we're going to announce the way that we actually calculate the decentralization ratio so that it's very clear the way that we're scoring ourselves, we're scoring other stablecoin projects, we're, how we're thinking about it, right? How we're actually claiming. So for example, if someone on crypto Twitter or somewhere likes to say, hey, Frax is actually just all wrapped USDC, it's not exciting or interesting, someone can come correct them and be like, actually, that's wrong. Frax is only 6% backed by USDC. And right. here's the, you know, here's the framework for calculating that. Here's everything. You know, you should correct yourself and, and, and stuff like that. Without some clear algorithm or equation or framework, it's difficult to kind of set the record straight. So first, we're going to release that framework and then and the other AMOs that are supposed to be able to intake uh, volatile assets. That's awesome, man. So like if I'm understanding things correctly, Frax is kind of the USDC has kind of been almost like a, an MVP model and, and you guys are looking to make Frax into something a lot more decentralized and scalable, I guess. Yeah, and we've just been building on top of the, the base core concept the more that it's been proving to be sound, right? And... For example, we've built our AMO framework using, you know, the idea of like a fractional algorithmic stablecoin. And then we're using our newer ideas to slowly phase out USDC. I think it's it's difficult to solve every problem at once, right? And so, for example, one thing I kind of equate to getting rid of fiat coins or custodial risk assets inside of an algorithmic stablecoin is like ETH moving to proof of stake. Everyone knows on, on day one, even in like 2015 and 16, you know, Vitalik was saying, you know, I think we're going to eventually move to proof of stake. I think we're going to, you know, do it and stuff. They obviously hadn't fully, you know, created the consensus mechanism and stuff back in like 2016 uh, and, and stuff. But everyone had this expectation and it was kind of the goal, right? It was the end goal. And this is kind of like the stablecoin version of ETH2 or proof of stake, right? It's like you finally fully decentralize and swap out the, the kind of consensus mechanism, so to speak, right? The USDC is currently the consensus mechanism or, or kind of the backbone, right? The, the thing that's proving the theory and the algorithms and the monetary policy is, is workable. And then once we do, you know, the final upgrade and phase out, there will be like a stable coin frax merge, so to speak, of new new collateral, the same way that ETH will have a merge with, with ETH too. It makes sense. Yeah, definitely excited to see that happen. And it leads me to, to another question on regulation. You've probably heard a lot of questions, or, you know, recently, if certain stable coins fall under certain jurisdictions and how they will be regulated. And like, is that something you guys are kind of thinking about at Frax? 
Yeah. So whether the stable coins will or won't be regulated in, in like a certain way, I think that we will have to make sure that Frax is accomplishing its like mission of being fully decentralized, permissionless in terms of not relying on a stable coin like collateral that can always be potentially, you know, either regulated or blacklisted right. protocol or something in the future. But what's really interesting is actually, I actually like to pose the exact opposite thing to, to most people because all of the conversations right now are about what happens if there's like a black swan regulatory event and stable coins right. and no one can use USDC or Tether or whatever, or they collapse or like they, they blacklist everything or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I actually like to ask the exact opposite because it actually highlights the stuff we're doing at Frax for the crypto native CPI, which right now is, is codenamed the Frax Price Index. And one of the things I like to ask is, imagine if... Just hypothetically, because most people don't consider this. Imagine if like the, the Treasury Department or, or like the, the regulators came out and said, OK, you know what? Actually, USDC and Tether, we're just going to treat them like digital cash. Anyone can use them. No KYC, no nothing. Like literally everyone just have fun and have a great time. Like you guys can just like do whatever you want. Right. <laughs> and if you think about that for a second. Right. What reason would there be for any on-chain like decentralized blah, 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 or like DAI or even like Frax or, or anything, right, to exist if like, if you had like a very, very strong confidence that, oh, okay, the, this USDC is just digital cash, right? It's, it's literally just digital cash and they're going to release like an audit report every quarter, just like every, you know, multi-billion dollar company. Great, right? Like what, what, on-chain stable coins would have reason to really exist at that point. Right. Yeah. It's like an ideological question, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And also, I think that the thing that that question poses is like, it gets at the nature of like, what are we trying to build with stable coins in the sense that we want to provide on-chain permissionless stability. Right. And the reason we use the dollar as a unit right now is the dollar is basically what most global trade is settled in. It's like the unit that people can talk about when it comes to economic value. It's almost like the SI unit of value. Right. It's like it's like meters is for distance. You know, joules is for energy. Dollars is for uh, economics, even though it's not an official <laughs> unit. Right. But I think that the next phase of it will be what if we can define our own peg, you know, a crypto native CPI or a crypto native peg, because the dollar just loosely tracks the CPI plus some inflation that the U.S. government targets to, you know, stimulate spending and growth, right? What if, you know, we actually create a better version, a better decentralized one, then we won't need permission for the fiat coins or, or anything like that to allow us to use them as collateral or, or any right. of that stuff, right? And that's actually really exciting, right? That's kind of what we're trying to start doing with the Frax Price Index, which to my knowledge is the first serious attempt by any project to actually bring the consumer price index on chain, improve it, add new price indices, potentially add some digital price indices if it's going to help improve it, actually release this, you know, protocol and and have many stablecoin projects use that reference rate as a new unit to peg to. So then, for example, if there's a lot of stable coins that peg to the Frax price index, then you can have curve pools, for example, that are stable swap pools, right? That that are for pegged assets to the FPI, right? And there'd be deep liquidity on that peg. That peg would become legitimized, right? And so you could have Uniswap V3 range orders at that peg, right? So there'd be deep liquidity at that range. And so people can really trade on on that unit right and if that unit is actually decentralized it's stable right if you hold like you know a million units of the fpi for example it's like similar but even better perhaps hopefully right than holding a million dollars because it should be able to get you the same amount of food housing cars car value you know energy all of this stuff consumables right and 
that's actually really, really interesting, right? If, if we can do that, if we can get other stablecoin projects to come into this with us. And so far, actually, we've gotten a lot of interest to the point where, you know, I was talking with Joey from Fay, Amin and Stefan from Rye at, at Reflexor Labs. There's a lot of interest. And I think we kind of have to be able to coordinate well w- with each other because as, as things get bigger, you get that coordination problem. But cool. it's gotten a lot of interest and it seems like it's, it's really the right direction to the point where if we can get formally other big stablecoin projects to actually join the Frax price index. In fact, one of my first suggestions was we should rename it something that's not just Frax because it's then bigger than just ourselves, right? It's bigger than just this one project tackling such a, such a big um, vision. That's awesome, man. What implications do you think inflation would have? This obviously against the kind of backdrop of the whole crypto ecosystem is this Everyone's imagining this like black swan event where hyperinflation takes off and people are pushing wheelbarrows full of cash to the supermarket. And if you look at history, it is actually quite possible, obviously, for it to happen. And, you know, is this something that is like motivating you in this the, the price index? Maybe it's not super exciting to say, but I'm actually pretty skeptical of their going to be like, you know, Zimbabwe or Venezuela level inflation anytime soon in in like Western developed democracies, especially ones that use the dollar itself. But why why is that? You know, can you expand on that? First of all, I mean, yeah, things are definitely getting a little bit more expensive, right? Like the no one can deny that. In fact, even, you know, Jerome Powell has had to say, well, inflation seems to be a little bit higher and hotter than we thought. It's like, well, no, no shit, right? But if you if you look, for example, where's inflation if if like the BTC price is like, you know, 40% lower than than its all-time high, right? Obviously, it's been doing really well the past month, but crypto against the dollar itself is is down, right? It's it's significantly down and obviously now it's it's doing a little bit better, but who knows month to month things like change in crypto, but the way that people talk about pushing wheelbarrows down the street is you'd expect like Bitcoin to not be losing any value, in fact going parabolic against the dollar, right? But maybe they mean in a much larger time scale, right? And that's a view I, I I can entertain. But what I actually think is more important is people are just a little frustrated about not being able to hold something that's more inflation resistant, but still keeps their standard of living the same. And I think that's right. one of the main things that the you know Frax price index or a, a new crypto native CPI will solve because we don't plan to have the inflation factor that the Fed targets because we're not a country, right? We don't need to stimulate growth and in, in like the local economy and stuff. So I think the main issue is like you can't actually flee inflation into fixed supply assets. I mean that's just again going back to my own personal views and how I, I started thinking about stable coins is like just think about a currency, right? The the main goal in my opinion, I mean we could just disagree about the primary premise, is that it should keep your standard of living the same so that, for example, you can make investments, right? And what is an investment? Well, an investment by definition should be, if it's a good one, it should change your standard of living, right? It should actually do the exact opposite of a currency. If a currency is supposed to make you be able to afford the same house, the same food, the same things, the same rent and all of this stuff, an investment is supposed to be able to change what you can buy again denominated in that in that stable currency right so you make a bunch of investments and you can hopefully if they're good ones will increase your standard of living because now you can buy more things after you sell it for the currency right the price stable currency and so for example i just i just think that it's very big in cognitive dissonance of of like btc maxis and and stuff that say oh well BTC is the greatest investment you can make. It'll also be money. It'll also have everything denominated and just give it time. And and like, it's also the meaning of the universe. It's also like how you can uh, travel through time. It's also like literally everything. (laughs) Right. And and like, it it doesn't have to be all those things to be a many multi-trillion dollar asset and a great investment. In fact, my personal opinion is it's like a it's almost mutually exclusive that something can be a good investment and a good currency that that makes no sense how they can be both. 
So I, I might be wrong, but th that's why I'm interested in the stablecoin space. And so some BTC maxis or something yell at me and stuff. And they're like, well, you're just trying to shill your own shit coin or, or something like <laughs> that. And it's like, well, did you consider the fact that I, I went into this because first, I thought this instead of the other way around, right? People like accuse you in like crypto of like, you're just saying all these things because you have a vested interest. Like, well, no, listen, I built my vested interest because of my belief, which came first, right? And, and then I forming my beliefs after building out the system. So it's been interesting talking to people about, you know, the, the role of truly, you know, innovative stable coins, BTC, and ETH and, and stuff. And I'm very, very bullish, all, all three, right? I'm, I'm very bullish Bitcoin, very bullish mm -hmm. Ethereum. In fact, I, I think essentially like after EIP 1559, Ethereum is probably one of the most fundamentally sound crypto assets by far than anything other than maybe Bitcoin. Although I slightly think that, you know, Ethereum is, is, a, is a little bit cooler than Bitcoin, but the, those things are all debatable, right? I mean, those things are, are like basically which one do you prefer as the store of value, right? The funny thing is that it's just so heavily price driven, right? Like I remember, I think it was a year ago or a year and a half ago, sort of end of 2019, early 2020, when ETH was kind of down against BTC and the narrative was very, very, it was all FUD, right? And it's just interesting to see how when you stick around through a few price cycles to see kind of how like emerges. Yeah, exactly. The, and the I've seen a bunch of cycles, right? I've been around the block a, a few times now. And what's interesting is, is like everything in terms of price is denominated in the, in the stable unit, right? In, in the dollar. Right. Right. The ironic, isn't it? Like it's so ironic that everyone in crypto talks about their they make yeah, their vision like you, you know fiat, it, right? Exactly. <laughs> and it's not going down, right? I mean that that's the thing. Like you you know, there's that Bitcoin Neo meme, right? Which is like, you know, you're telling me like one day I'll be able to convert my Bitcoin for like ten million dollars a coin, and then you know the meme is like I'm saying when when you're ready, you, you know, you, you won't have to, you know, cause the implications like you won't yeah, even yeah. be using dollars. Right. But if you look, the proliferation of stable coins has just exponentially increased. Things are more denominated and not BTC, but, but stable coin pairs and BTC pairs have like dramatically lowered. Right. And so, you know, I remember when everything was listed against BTC because like everyone was, you know, trying to accumulate BTC, right? You traded altcoins to buy more BTC. In fact, when I was mining, there was these things called multi pools, which would you would just point your hash rate to the pool and the pool operator would select the, the most profitable script or GPU coin to mine that day. And then they would actually convert all of the proceeds to BTC and pay out the miners in Bitcoin. So in fact, you were basically selling hash rate for, for BTC. And there was like huge pools that were doing that, like lawful pool back in the day and, and others. That's actually not the case anymore. It hasn't gotten more like that. It's actually gotten less like that. People just swap to, to stable coins. Right? People are just like, here, I, I'm going to sell this thing and then I'm going to hold like, you know, Frax, DAI, USDC, USDT or whatever, right? And it just seems like, you know, the, the law of financial evolution is indeed that people gravitate to the unit of account that keeps their standard of living relatively the same and like we could argue maybe the dollar should be better it's it's inflating too much on average or something but but compared to what right it's like all of these scarce digital assets they don't hold your standard of living the same they're an investment so you then denominate it in the stable asset right and and yeah I just thought of it like an important kind of distinction there to carry on with your idea that a lot of people deeply entrenched in crypto, they, you know, they kind of say they hold their BTC, they hold their ETH, that's their, their hodl, right? That's their long-term thing. And their common criticism of, you know, the so-called retail public, supposedly like financially illiterate people that don't invest, right? They have their savings account. And if you think about it, it's interesting that generally speaking, people in crypto, they have those, they have their, their, their stacks of BTC, ETH, whatever, but in terms of their savings accounts, and it's it's all stable coins, it's all DeFi, to your point, it's all high yield savings accounts, right? 
And I think that it's kind of interesting. Recently, I've had many conversations with people explaining. I've been traveling and they've been asking me what area I work in. And when you say cryptocurrency, that they don't really get it. They, they say, oh, Dogecoin. Oh, you know, they don't see the value of the investment world because it's potentially not something they're involved in. But as soon as you start talking to them and saying, well, my interest account is 25% per year, you know, their eyes light up. Yeah, they're like, they almost think like almost it's so big that it's almost like this must be a scam or something, right? right? It's just fascinating to see how stable coins have really kind of pushed the narrative beyond, you know, cryptocurrency as like this speculative investment and more towards this is the future of fintech, you know? Yeah, and it's so obvious, right? It, it's so obvious that the most exciting part of tech is is right here in like DeFi, crypto, and I guess recently maybe some some JPEGs in the NFT right. space. But yeah, like my actual view on this, by the way, is that I think that the higher than TradFi interest rates will actually always persist. I don't think there'll be some crazy amount like 20%, 50%, 60% or something because there's still a lot of capital inefficiency, right? There's people like there's protocols paying a lot of money for like, you know, transient liquidity that, you know, will flee as soon as there's there isn't a lot of rewards and stuff. And so they're overpaying for what they're getting. But I don't think we're actually ever going to go back to the 0.2% interest or even lower than that, that a TradFi bank gives because, there's just so many intermediaries and and places and just real inefficiency and middlemen that capture all of the value and yield in all of this stuff in, in the traditional financial space. Even if the Fed interest rate is like 0%, you know that banks are doing something that they give them higher than 0%, right? I'm not saying they're getting right. DeFi yields, but they're definitely making money. And so, but, but like, you're not, like, you're not getting any of that at all in terms of like your checking or savings account. Right. And th that is the, the thing that will never go back in terms of like, they'll never get that control of being able to just take all of the, the yield for themselves because they're just kind of a protected class of business in the entire financial industry. So I think we're always going to have base interest rate now accessible by anyone around the world that's much, much higher than the average Western country's savings account. I think it's always going to be at least, at least, you know, two, three, four or five percent, depending on like, you know, where, what protocols and, and stuff. And I don't think it's going to go to go to zero. I, I really <laughs> don't think we're ever going there. Yeah, I, I love it. And I hope that, as you say, we continue to outcompete and I guess just continue to eat up traditional finance. Yeah. And, and I think the most interesting part of it is that people that are designing the newer stuff, that they're not actually looking to recreate the exact same stuff. Like maybe we'll have time in a, in a future podcast or something to go over what we're doing, AMOs at, at Frax and stuff. But like one of the cool things is like, we're, we're designing these, these monetary policy Legos. And what's really interesting about them is like they, they don't exist in TradFi, right? And, and they're a new way to build stable coins. And these things are just like new primitives that haven't existed before. They're not just building, for example, lending or something, right. but, but just on, on chain. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, I think, you know, we've, we've kind of covered a, a ton of interesting ground today. And it's been super interesting to learn more about Frax and, and the vision. I think that Frax has one of the most kind of engaged communities I've seen around stablecoins. So yeah, super, super excited to be working with you guys. And yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for coming on today, Sam. Appreciate it. Of course. Yeah, thank you so much. We're, we're also really really excited to work with you guys and Stake DAO as well as just the entire curve at ecosystem and, and DeFi in, in general, because one of the things I actually always like to say is like Frax is totally crypto native. It's fully on chain. And we have as a protocol, a vested interest and aligned incentive to see the on chain protocols that we work with grow very big, right? Because our playground is the, is the digital crypto space, right? And in fact, you know, sometimes for example, I I like kind of compare, although I, I like SBF and stuff, sometimes I compare like, you know, you see them farming a bunch of stuff and then and then dumping it and, and like, you know, dumping on all of these protocols because they have like a stadium to, 
Dubai or something, right? Or, or right, like right. they have like real world stuff. And hey, that that's totally fine, right? But one of the things I always like to point out is we always really, really love working with partners and having on-chain partnerships because we're not going anywhere. Like Frax is not like buying real world assets or like fiat or like, you know, doing Super Bowl marketing and, and stuff like that. We have a direct vested interest of staying on chain and kind of being the stable coin that helps all of our partners and people who integrate cracks basically grow to become big players because the more they use us, the more we can grow with them, the positive sum value that's created for, for everyone on chain. Yeah, I love the vision and I think we we share that vision at Sektao and super excited to to continue working together, man. Thanks a lot, Sam. Take care. It was awesome being on. See you.